Hi. Um, so I wanted to make this video to talk about uh, an article that I discovered recently, even though the article itself is pretty old. I mean, 2004 is like, you know, more than 14 years ago. Um, but it's still very much relevant, and it has uh, some very interesting tricks described in it. So the general idea, you know, as the title say, uh, is combined to, um, to, you know, 8-bit, uh, in this case, PWM, um, to create a higher resolution, uh, you know, DAC. So the, in this particular um, article, the author basically had a, a problem, is that he wanted a 16-bit DAC, uh, but that had to be uh, space qualified, and there was no suitable parts in the uh, approved parts list, and so it took, um, you know, whatever parts they had available, um, which included uh, 8051 with two 8-bit PWM outputs uh, to create a high-resolution 16-bit DAC. Uh, in my particular case, the application that I have in mind is to use an ICE40 FPGA, um, and um, instead of PWM, I'm going to be using um, PDM, Pulse Density Modulation, modulation um, you know, the, the output of a Delta Sigma uh, stage, essentially. Um, and the voltage um, is going to control um, either a VCTXO or um, or an OCXO, you know, to adjust its frequency and, and lock it to GPS. And so I want to evaluate this circuit and, and how it can be adapted uh, and used on a ice 40 FPGA uh, for this application. So um, before we, you know, go into that, uh, I'm going to try to explain, you know, very quickly how this uh, circuit works because you know when you look at it, it's not entirely obvious. Obviously, you can read the you know original article. Uh, it goes into details about how it works and, and, and some of the math. Uh, but I'm go I'm gonna go through it um, um, very quickly. So let's imagine that you have your two uh, PWM output. And let's say that this is the uh, most significant one. Uh, this is going to be the uh, least significant one. Now, you know, for all the reasoning, we're going to assume that these are actually um, analog outputs. Obviously, they're not. The, the digital output uh, was, you know, average value is is some analog value, but. Uh, um, for for the reasoning here, you can just consider that uh, you know they're analog outputs. Um, the first thing to do is basically go through a resistive adder where you just, you know, essentially sum um, the output of, uh, of those two. You have a resistor value here, another resistor value here, and if you make it so that, you know, the LSB resistor value is 2 to the power of n larger than the um, MSB resistor value, that means that the contribution um, to the output voltage is going to be, you know, um, uh, much less for the LSB, and so you have a, a finer control using the LSB and uh, uh, more control uh, of the voltage, but less precision with the MSB, which is, you know, exactly what you want, basically. Um, now, that's the... Um, First step, essentially. Now, after this, you know this is a you know digital uh, signal, which means if you want an analog value, you want to uh, low, uh, low pass filter it. So you can go through an RC filter and something like this. And that would essentially, you know, be your very, very basic um, uh, version. Now, there are several things you can do to improve this. Um, the first thing is try to, trying to reduce the ripple. You know, this is a digital signal, which means there's a lot of high frequency content, and you want to get rid of that because, you know, this essentially noise at your output, which, which you don't want. Um, now you can filter some of it using that RC network, but 
the more you increase the time constant of that RC network, you know, the slower the response of your DAC is going to be. Um, and so a very nice trick that, explain, uh, that is explained in that article is um, how to get rid of that high frequency noise um, by adding a second pole essentially to that filter. Now, you could add a second pole, you know, using a second stage RC filter. You'd put another resistor and, I'll, and another, you know, filter stage essentially RC here, uh, which would be kind of, you know, the same thing. You'd, you'd be an adding another pole to the filter. Um, again, the problem is that you raise the time constant and you raise the output impedance, um, and you can do much better. Um, and for this, you're going to need some other outputs. Um, and those are basically inverted versions of your original signals. Now, in the article, it does that using, you know, standard HC14 inverters, but on the FPGA, I'm just going to have some other I.O. that are with inverted you know, version of the internal signals, that's really no problem. Um, you go through the same adder using the same ratio of resistor. And what you're going to do here is basically I pass it. So here, what you have is the same I frequency content that you have here, but opposite in sign. And so, if you add this to your to the signal, <laughs> what you're essentially doing is can is actively canceling all the uh, high frequency noise that you have here. That's the first trick that is in, in this article, and we're gonna uh, compare and see um, if that technique is is really efficient or not, uh, if it's uh, really worthwhile. Um, the other trick that's in the article is how to compensate for the imperfection of the drive of the PWM drivers. You know, ideally your PWM drivers, you know, that'd be a, a push pull similar uh, driver. But it's 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 uh, it's not ideal. It has some output resistance, right? And whatever imperfection you have here is gonna be a problem um, because it's going to be added essentially to those values and it's going to screw up your ratio here and, and this isn't actually constant so you can't just you know pick another res resistor value um, so for the LSB um, output it, it's not it does not really matter because R2 is going to be very very big I mean it's going to be like 256 times for instance larger than R1 um, so if you have R1 which is you know like a, a few uh, Kilo ohms, um, R2 is going to be you know 500 kilo ohm or, or nearly one mega ohm, and, and RS here is going to be in the range you know less than 50 ohm or something. Um, and so when you have 50 ohm added to one mega ohm, it's not going to change anything. Um, on the other hand, R1 is going to be you know in the few uh, kilo ohm range, and so 50 ohm is not that neglectable. Uh, if, if you're talking a 16 bit DAC it starts to be uh, to be significant so trying to reduce the effect of RS um, is a good thing and so the way to do this is essentially add a resistor here which is equal to R2 and uh, wait no sorry um, I mixed it up uh, I draw this a little weird but Okay, this. Okay, that's the way it needs uh, it needs to be. Um, it goes between the um, you know positive version of the MSB signal and the uh, inverted version of the LSB signal. You have a R two um, resistor. Um, and um, What it's going to do is essentially try to compensate the load that's seen by um, by L1 um, by by this path essentially, um, so that 
the contribution of RS is uh, is greatly um, is greatly diminished. I mean, you can go and walk through the math that I explained through the article, but um, I haven't tested the efficacy of this, uh, you know, compared with or without what uh, it explained in the in the original article. And so this is uh, what we're going to try to um, to implement basically in a in ice 40 FPGA. So this is our target. Um, this is an ICE40 Ultra Plus breakout board, uh, as you can see here. Um, that's basically the best ICE40 um, Ultra Plus board that I have um, at the moment. Um, I also have a LP1K board, um, but it doesn't have a PLL, which um, is somewhat useful here. Um, and I also have like this um, Arduino board but it's not really practical to program it because it doesn't have an embedded programmer uh, while this this thing has the uh, FTDI um, you know available directly so you can um, basically just need to connect your PC to the to this board um, hopefully there will be a better board um, soon there is a crowd supply um, campaign um, that's going to be launched soon for the uh, icebreaker um, so definitely check that out when uh, when it's available uh, or it might already be you know available to buy when you watch this video um, but obviously that's just generic board it doesn't have any of the uh, custom hardware that uh, we need to evaluate this circuit and so I hacked up together uh, this thing uh, let me try if I can uh, focus this Okay, um, go the right way around. So, um, find something to point at. Here you have the four inputs and then you have the ground. Um, and so you have the four resistors. This is the uh, I pass capacitor for the active cancelling. These are the two. Uh, final summing resistor and that's the uh, capacitor of the um, the final LC filter and then you have the output to SMA uh, so this is really uh, um, act up together in like you know 10 minutes just cutting a, a PC board and soldering uh, but it is actually a PMOD compatible uh, um, pinout and so yeah that's what uh, we're gonna test uh, now. It goes and plug in the board uh, here. Let me see like this. Yeah, like this. Uh, and then I can program the board and um, output. So obviously um, we're gonna need to measure the output um, first check the DC value check that you know it actually hacked uh, as a DAC um, check the um, noise on the output um, and to do this I'm gonna use a spectrum analyzer uh, in this case it's a um, Roden Schwad FSQ8 um, spectrum analyzer and so we're gonna uh, look at the noise at the output and we're gonna um, try to drive um, an OCXO uh, with this. So here I have a, um, an O6O that I'm currently uh, pre-eating uh, for future tests. Uh, this is like a eBay special, like the, the classic uh, Morion. Uh, let me see if, uh, if I can focus on that. Um, yeah, it's a MV200, 10 megahertz. Um, 12 volts and I'm currently uh, powering it uh, and so we're gonna try to see if we can change its frequency using this um, as the control voltage um, and then we're gonna also look at the output of the phase noise of this oscillator when it's driven by this DAC or when it's driven by a you know just a resistor which is gonna be basically a reference to measure the the base phase noise of that uh, oscillator. So 
I'm gonna do the setup and I'll be back shortly. So this is our first test, which is a um, very basic, um, you know, DC test. Um, this is the actual circuit with the actual values that are implemented in, in this board. I, I didn't have, you know, a um, resistor on hand that had a, a ratio of 256. So I just picked some values. Um, that means that you can't, you know, use both parts of the DAC as a, as a single one, uh, basically, because it's not going to be monotonic. Um, but for my particular application, for those tests, it, it really doesn't matter. Um, because for most of the tests here, we're just going to, you know, change the values and see if it matches what we expect. And for my final application, I will actually be using them as, as two separate um, as two separate part, um, the MSB are gonna basically be a coarse adjustment for the frequency, just to get it into the uh, appropriate range. And then I'm just gonna modify the uh, the LSB values um, um, to you know do tracking basically of, of, of the frequency. So the ratio is 204. Um, each output is driven by a 12 bits uh, pulse density modulator using a uh, delta sigma. And so for each step of the uh, high bar, of the high word, uh, we expect a change of r roughly um, 0 0.8 millivolts. And for the um, low word, we basically expect 3.9 microvolts. Now, um, there is no way I can measure 3.9 microvolts. The highest precision meter that I have is this uh, EV block 121GW, which is a 50,000 count meter. Um, I don't have any bench millimeter. Um, maybe the Key Slate 2400 would have a higher precision, but it's it's not set up at the moment, so I'm, I'm just going to use this. Um, we're not testing DC accuracy anyway. Um, as I said in my application, um, you know, even DC accuracy doesn't matter um, because it's a regulation loop, so any offset would just be, you know, taken care of by the regulation loop. So um, I have loaded the FPGA with a you know simple design, um, and I have a, a control software here um, that lets me set both the uh, the low and the high word, and also uh, this argument bipolar um, allows me to enable or disable this part of the circuit. You know the kind of the bipolar output where you actively try to cancel the high frequency noise uh, because I want to test um, if this part of the circuit is, is really um, efficient or not. So, you know, um, of course I need to actually make sure that this is plugged in. So this is the test setup for the um, testing the DC uh, component of, uh, of this circuit. Um, this is the circuit with the actual value that I used on, on this little test board. I didn't have you know proper resistor value with a uh, um, 256 or 512 or, or you know any power of two ratio between the two. So I just picked what I, I had on hand. Um, this will mean that you can't just you know use both part of um, of the DAC. As a, as a single one, uh, but for my, for my application and for these tests, it, it won't matter. Um, this design that's loaded in the FPGA implements two 12 bits uh, pulse density modulators, um, and um, you know they're supplied with 3.3 volts, which means that for the high word we expect a step of 0 0.8 millivolts, and for the low word we expect a step of 3.9 microvolts. Now, I don't have anything that can measure, you know, 3.9 microvolts accurately or even at all, really, uh, because the highest precision meter that I have on hand is the EEV block 121 GW, which is a 50,000 count meter, um, and so well, this this will have to do for now, basically. Now the device is um, is loaded already, and I have a, a small control software that allows me from the PC to control the the PDM output. And I can also choose, uh, you know, this argument here, bipolar, 
Um, that allows me to select if this part of the circuit, the kind of active noise cancellation um, part, is enabled or not. If uh, if this argument is set to false, basically the FPGA, this output and this output, are um, tri-stated, um, which means all of this basically does nothing. Okay, so let's just try it. So um, let's say I want um, this should be roughly 0 0.8 millivolt. And it is. Okay, let's try 100. Great, so this part of the circuit seems to work. Um, as you can see, I also drive the LED here. Um, <laughs> with the, the, the pulse density value, um, just as a, a debug help. So if I put this to the maximum intensity, you know, that's, you know, roughly, or, or well, it's 3.26 volts, not 3.3 volts, but uh, you see the, the idea. Okay, so now let's say I just set this to zero again. And the voltage come back to nearly zero. Now let's try the low step. Now I can try to raise it by a single step, but yeah, we don't see anything because the, the, the meter just doesn't have the precision. Uh, but if we try 10, you know, that would give us roughly 39 microvolts. And we should be able to see this. I can even switch to millivolt here. Um, That's interesting, like why do I have uh oh, I guess I have an, uh, an offset. Um, so let's see, I'm going to put to zero, then switch the meter to relative mode. And then here I'm just going to set 10. And yeah, we have something like... 36 microvolts instead of the expected 3.9 microvolts. But, you know, precision of the setup, it's not exactly 3.3 volts. Uh, the resistor values are, are probably 5%, so it's um, it's good enough, I think, for, for this test. And, and I can try a large value as well. Let's see here the maximum. And I can, you, you know, output 15, 15 millivolts, and I can try that I can effectively add both of them. So if I do this, I should have basically 15.1 millivolt plus 0 0.8 millivolts. This should give me nearly 16, a little under 16 millivolts. And yeah, that uh, seems correct to me. Within, you know, the precision of the of the system, but as, as I said, it's uh, it's just to test the the principle that it works. Um, I can try the bipolar mode. This should not, in theory, change the actual DC output. Uh, but as we will see, it does slightly change the LSB. Um, and you know, if we go to zero zero. We can see that there is a, there is actually a small offset, and if you look at the schematic, you, you'll see you'll see why is that if both outputs are zero, this one is uh, is set to one, and you actually have a DC pass uh, that goes from there to there to there, and so this actually introduces a slight DC um, DC bias in your in your output. This uh, this particular resistor um, shouldn't be a problem for my application anyway, so I'm. Uh, I'm good with this. Um, so now we're gonna test the uh, noise on the output. Um, and for this, I need to change the setup again and um, connect it to a spectrum analyzer. Okay, so this is the setup for uh, testing the noise on the output. Um, so same circuit, except uh, now I have um, the output connected through a SMA to a uh, Roland Schwartz FSQ8 um, spectrum analyzer that you unfortunately can't see because I don't have a good camera setup and my desk is a mess at the moment. 
but thankfully we have um, remote access and so I can actually show you the screen of the FSQ8s and there you go um, there you go now you should be able to see the screen and you can see also that I configured the output to some value and I have bipolar equal false which means at the moment I don't have the active noise cancellation so kind of um, this part of the circuit is, is currently disabled and these are outputs um, I picked some PDM value that generated some you know spikes um, because of the nature of a Delta Sigma uh, converter the um, spurs are going to be different depending on the on the actual output value um, and, and that's what you can see here um, so as you can see they are actually pretty small already I mean um, the only thing between the output here and um, the input of the spectrum analyzer is a mini circuit DC blocker uh, I mean Technically, the, the, the spectrum analyzer is AC coupled, but I just wanted to make sure I wasn't going to damage my spectrum analyzer, so I added uh, an additional DC blocker, um, which is good, you know, down to 100 kilohertz. So, and here we are looking from um, 50 kilohertz uh, up to 10 megahertz, basically. And so we can see some spur. The highest one is at 3.74 megahertz, and it's down to you know minus 74 dBm, which is you know it's it's already pretty low. Um, I don't know of and uh, how many microvolt that is. Uh, let me look. Uh, let me look that up um, quickly. Um, or maybe we can actually display it. Um, or whatever. Anyway, uh, I mean, minus 74 dBm is, is really low already. But now we can actually test, does the active noise cancellation does anything? And so now I'm going to enable the bipolar output. Again, this part of the circuit, which, you know, I, I passes the output and try to subtract it from the, um, the actual output. Um, there we go. And as you can see, the spurs have almost all disappeared. I mean, you can still see that one, but it's, it's almost done in the spectrum analyzer noise. Um, I mean, this is... We're now, you know, around minus 98. Yeah, let's say minus, minus 98 or something. And if I disable it again... Minus 74. So minus 98. 74. That gives us nearly 24, 25 dB of reduction, uh, of additional reduction of the noise, which is really good. And, and I mean, getting down to minus 95, minus, uh, nearly minus um, 100 dB uh, of noise at the output is um, it's really great. And I think it's going to be perfectly suitable um for my application um so good so now what we can uh, test is uh connect the output to um an OCXO and see if we can actually you know tune the frequency of uh, of the OCXO um using using that output um so let me set that up and uh be back in a second Okay, so let me um, run you through the setup really quickly. Uh, the first thing I did is I soldered a couple of leads on the um, you know module to tap the output instead of uh, using the SMA. It made it easier to connect to the OCXO. So here under all the test lead, you have the uh, Morion MV200 OCXO. Um, this lead and this lead are the power coming from um, Agilent E3630A um, linear power supply, providing 12 volts. Uh, here we have two leads that go to the um, 121GW uh, multimeter, and that is reading the voltage on the voltage control pin. 
Um, at the moment, as you can see, that's the output of the DAC and it's disconnected from the voltage control pin and we read 4.1 volts. Um, that's because the voltage um, control pin of the OCXO is not actually um, you know, left floating, it has an internal pull up unfortunately and when you combine this with the high output, imp output impedance of this uh, DAC um, this means that the output won't be driven between 0 and 3.3 we will have some influence on the output of course but um, ideally we would have an op amp buffer uh, between the two because this has a, a relatively um, low input impedance and so if I connect the output um, of the DAC to the voltage control pin we can see that you know the voltage is not dropping to zero it's dropping to um, you know 2.2 volts or something um, but anyway for our tests it, it's gonna be fine um, because as you can see with this output we're actually s s below 10, 10 megahertz anyway and, and we don't care about precision we just um, want to see the influence um, if we can control the voltage and well we determined that we need a buffer ideally and then we're gonna test uh, the phase noise so um, yeah, I'm sorry for the flickering on the counter screen um, yeah obviously the counter is measuring the uh, 10 megahertz output from the uh, OCXO and the counter itself is a reference to a GPS um, source so let's try to change the output of the DAC and, uh, and see if we can control the frequency um, we go so the moment I configured you know to zero zero and we can try to change um, this uh, you know one step doesn't really have much influence uh, maybe we can try to increase the gate time on the counter um, to have more resolution um, gate um, time Yes, let's go to a one second gain time. Okay, now we have much more uh, resolution. So, yeah, one step really, it's not really measurable. Um, but if we go to you know 128 steps, yeah, we can see you know the influence of the output, and if we go to something really extreme, yeah, we can change the. Um, Yes, so now obviously um, the the output of even the 12 bit of the PDM itself is already pretty pretty good and, and doesn't is not going to have much influence on the frequency because the the sensitivity um, of this OCXO is uh, is pretty low, which means you, you can only make it go from you know like three hertz below 10 10 megahertz to like three hertz above or something, um, and so if you have uh, Three hertz divided uh, by you know, the five volt control range that it takes. Um, you know, you have roughly 0 0.6 um, hertz per volt, um, which mean one single step of uh, of our jack for the high word is 0 0.8 millivolts which mean each step should be something like uh, one, two, three, like 0 0.5 millihertz um, which yeah we're not gonna see um, I mean if we if we go to zero and we change 10 step we should have something like Three millihertz, maybe. Um, 
Yeah, sort of. I mean, yeah, the last number here is uh, something like 69. And 62. So we have 7 millihertz. So we're in the like right ballpark. But, you know, as I said, given the output impedance of... Um, of this and uh, the interaction with the input impedance of the OCXO voltage control pin, um, it's not it's not going to be exact. Um, but the point is, you know, that, that works. We can control the output, and we know that you know at least for this OCXO, ideally we need an op amp buffer at the output here because the output impedance here is is just too high to have um, um, a good you know output range basically. So now we're gonna test the phase noise uh, influence of driving it with this circuit and not um, just leaving it floating or you know, driving it from a, a simple resistor divider. Um, I'll make the setup for that and see you in a second. Okay, so here's the setup again. I have the, um, you know, FSQ8 um, started up. Um, the f and you know the circuit um, again the OCXO powered from a linear supply and the output is now fed through um, 20 dB attenuator and a DC block to the FSQ8 and at the moment the voltage control is just not connected you know, um, because I'm gonna do several measurements uh, the first one I actually disconnected um, the input from the FSQ8 altogether and I will do a reference measurement. Um, this will give me basically kind of a noise floor. Um, just, you know, um, yeah, the noise floor on the in, uh, of the instrument. Um, sorry to do this. Oh, maybe I should explain first uh, the setup I have. Uh, the FS Create has a, s a specialized phase noise application. That's what I'm running now. And you can uh, configure um, what you want to look at. And I told him that I want to go from 100 hertz to uh, 10 megahertz, basically. You know, he tells me it's going to take, you know, about 10 seconds. Um... No, I need, okay, go back. So I have uh, my um, reference measurement and this will actually show up all the time as th three is three here. Um, so now I'm gonna connect the OCXO output to the spectrum analyzer. It's going in the SMA. There we go. And I'm in single uh, sweep mode, so I would just do one sweep every time only, and look at the at the uh, smooth um, output. Um, okay. So the green trace is the reference trace that we recorded um, just before. So that's um, our output. Unfortunately, I don't think there is any way to save it. I only have three trays, so I can't have like a like a third. Uh, uh, unfortunately, um, so we'll have to basically just remember. Um, but we can take a, a, a few spot measurements. So we have a, a few spot measurements um, written at the top, and so we have minus. 124.86 for 1 kilohertz, then 10 kilohertz, 100 kilohertz, and 1 megahertz, minus 130.46, minus 
29, that's 69, minus 139, 71. Okay, and we can, you know, have a look. Um, there are some spurs between 100 hertz and 1 kilohertz, uh, but it's relatively limited. It's, it's you know, um, the highest smooth uh, spur here is at minus 115 or so. Minus 115. So, now the first measurement I'm gonna do is plug the jack, but tell it to output uh, zero, which is essentially a static value. Um, and there is no switching noise at all because you know when the um, the DAC, the, the delta sigma output zero, the, all the outputs are not toggling. And that's just to see the noise uh, with just you know the the electronics connected and 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 all the other stuff that could leak into um, the OCXO that are not actually linked to the delta sigma at all. Um, so, let me show you, there's the control, and I'm going to set the output to zero, and disable the bipolar, okay, and now I'm going to actually connect this, so that's the output, this goes to the voltage control pin, and this is the ground, this goes to ground. Okay, and now I can start a new measurement. Okay, so the measurement is done. If we compare this with the previous value, um, I mean, it's very, very similar. It's it's within one dB of the of the previous measurement, which you know, given it's only a single capture, I don't think it's um, it's that significant. Uh, there is a whole lot more spurs between 100 hertz and one kilohertz, though. Um, yeah, those go, I mean, the, the smoothed one go up to maybe 108 or something. Um, minus 108. Yeah, uh, let's go at minus 108. So that's something to, to watch out for. Uh, but the, you know, from 1 kilohertz to 10 megahertz, it's, I mean, there's no like huge spike or huge raise uh, of the noise floor or things like that, so I think it's fine. Um, but now we can actually, you know, output something out of the deck, so there is some toggling. So let's output one. I'm picking some, you know, kind of random value, but I I, I know this is generate some some spurs. Um, in the uh, output control voltage, and I want to see the influence on, on, on the phase noise of this. Um, there we go. I should note also, I mean, obviously changing the DAC value is going to change the frequency, but the FSQ8 is configured to track frequency, and so the very small amount of frequency that it's, it's going to shift is going to be tracked automatically by, by the FSQ8. Uh, let's make another measure. Okay, so the the values between one kilohertz and one megahertz again, they're within one dB of the uh, the first measurement we we done we did, um, and between one hundred hertz and one kilohertz, to me it looks very very similar to the the previous results. So I don't think there's um, there is really anything there. Um, okay, 
So let's try without the bipolar, so without the noise cancellation. Maybe maybe this will show up some of the spurs. So let's disable this and run another sweep. Yeah, honestly, again, within 1 dB, I don't see anything. So, several possibilities here. Um, either I'm somehow misusing that phase measurement application, um, but I don't think I am. I think I, I read the manual correctly. Um, or the you know more likely possibility is just that... Um, the influence of the phase noise is, is, you know, pretty small, and we just can't measure it with uh, uh, with the spectrum analyzer itself um, because the noise flow is just too is just too high. Um, so I'll think about that and, and see if I can do more tests. Or um, feel free to comment if you think of other things I could test. But I think I could definitely use that um, DAC to control the uh, VCTXO or uh, noise XO. Um, just need, you know, an op-amp buffer. And I'm sure it has some influence on the phase noise because, you know, everything has influence on the phase noise, but um, the point is, you know, is it low, is it low enough to, to not be a problem for um, most application? Um, and I definitely think um, it is. Okay, well, um, thank you for watching. And I guess maybe see you in the next video uh, whenever I think of one. Bye.